Well, thank you. So here we are. It's it's Friday. It's my fest. I hope everybody is here to just relax and enjoy a conversation. Uh, we don't have a slide deck. We're not sharing slides. We're just sharing ideas. Um, so my name is Laura. I'm one of the, the organizers for my fest. And I'm also someone who is passionately interested in African folk tales and storytelling traditions. And so that is how I met Helen and they at Twitter who is joining us from Atlanta. Uh, and let's see, Helen, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear and see oh, me? All right. So I am not going to try to introduce Helen myself. I'm going to let Helen introduce herself. And then I've got all kinds of questions that I want to ask Helen, because I'm always learning new things about her work. Uh, but I also hope people will feel free to jump in with questions in the chat or ask your own questions. But Helen, tell us about mythological Africans and what you do. All right, all right. So thank you um, for inviting me, my first, Laura, Nate, and everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I've attended one of these sessions as a participant, so it's a bit different being, you know, on the panelist end of things. But it really is my pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Helen Nde. It's spelled N-D-E, and it's pronounced as the second syllable of the word Monday, so Nde. And I curate Mythological Africans, which some of you may know. It's a platform on Twitter mainly, but we also have a YouTube page, a blog, a newsletter, and um, other ways in which we uh, provide information about African mythology and folklore. And that really is the lifeblood of Mythological Africans. We talk myths, folklore from the African continent and the cultures out of which they come. Um, is, is that okay for now, Laura, or do you want me to go further? I know some of the questions and things we'll talk about, we'll delve into this some more, so I don't want to like jump ahead of the, the gun. Is that the expression? Jump the gun? Yeah. I think you're muted, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. My Zoom doom again. Um, I was just going to start with the, the great question, why? So why the name Mythological Africans? What's going on there? Why did you choose that as the name for your project? Right. So um, Mythological Africans, it's, it's a play. So obviously, it's about mythology and folklore from the African continent. So there's that you know, outright part. But it's also uh, poking a little bit of fun at the, you know, widely held among some people's idea that there is no mythology and folklore from the African continent, which, you know, is just now that, you know, we are here and we have access to the things we have access to, it's just ridiculous to even contemplate. But there are people out there who I hope know more, but used to really think that, you know, when you talk Greek mythology, you know, uh, Celtic mythology and Japanese, Chinese and Native American mythology, there were no such, you know, pantheons and stories and such from out of the African continent, which is patently false. So um, it, it's poking a little bit at that, that idea, you know, mythological Africans, but also just, you know, a statement of the fact that it's a platform for the mythologies and folklore of African people. And, and how did that start for you? I mean, how is this part of your own life journey that you felt called to do this? Right. So mythological Africans came out of really a desire to know my own roots. Um, I was born and raised in Cameroon, which is a West Central African country. And I moved to the US when I was about 20 or 21. And if you are an immigrant, this is something you probably have experienced. The fact that when you move to a place where, where you are not in you know, your comfort zone, you're not on your turf, there is a way in which you start seeing yourself through the eyes of other people. And what I realized the more time I spent in the US was that even though I was born and raised in Cameroon and had access to all these, you know, my roots, I knew the village where my people are from and you know, I had that, I had that grounding. In many ways, I didn't really know who I was. I didn't know the creation myths or the foundational myths of the people I'm from. I didn't know the folklore. I didn't. I literally didn't know anything. You know, I knew stories here and there from childhood, but I didn't have that grounding. And there are many African peoples who feel the same way as I do, as well as many others who are fortunately well grounded in their traditional histories and and stories and folklore and all of that. So Mythological Africans was my attempt to ferret out this information, to find out who I was, 
um, who are the people, the stock out of which I come, but also to dig into that for other African peoples who perhaps are feeling the, the weight of this alienation from self, so to speak. Especially since the this area nation is not something that is spontaneous, it, it was engineered by the process of colonization. Um, a lot of work effort was put in to disconnect many African peoples from traditional ways of knowing, traditional ways of learning, and traditional ways of being with the introdu introduction of Western education systems and things like that. So um, fortunately, there are people who are still grounded in the, the roots, the stories, the, the oral literature, the, the traditions. But there are many of us who, especially in the diaspora, feel this way. So this was sort of me doing a bit of a sankofa, you know, looking back to say, hey, what's going on there and how is this a part of me? And it started as, a, it really did start as a book I tried to write about Cameroon, so starting with the creation myths and some of the foundational legends of Cameroonian peoples, and then looking at folklore from Cameroonian people, um, looking at traditional cultural practices, food, and all that stuff. So I started there, and then when I felt a bit more ready, I, I launched the platform and approached it as looking at just African people in general, what are the, what are the myths, the folklore, but also what are the cultures out of which they come, because these stories don't exist in, in, in a vacuum. So that's you know, a short summary of how I got to where I am. And I have to say that the, the reception um, has really been encouraging. You know, it, it's, it's become a really helpful community for me because it's connecting with other people who have this um, hunger for knowledge as well, but also people who do know. So it, and, and across the platform, you know, from the continent into the diaspora, I, I see it as sort of people reaching out, holding hands and making these connections. And that has been very, very encouraging. Well, and of course, I'm still hoping, you know, for books from Helen, but tell us about that community building, because you've done that at, at Twitter, right, a lot at Twitter, which is a space that I really enjoy, but of course, Twitter can be toxic sometimes too, and, 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 and treacherous, but, but you make such good use of it, so, so tell us about some of that, of your, your Twitter community building. Right. So um, I have to say that my approach to Twitter these days comes from having been in a social media context which you know was steeped in that toxicity so the you know sniping the weird dynamics that can come up sometimes and this had a terrible terrible impact on my mental health on my sense of self on how i saw myself and so with with mythological africans i have really wanted to be intentional about creating a community where people can feel welcome can feel seen can feel heard can be comfortable asking questions because there's a lot that people just don't know. And if they don't know, it's not a moral feeling. It's just, they don't know. I started out not knowing much myself. So um, it, it really has come out of that, that, that desire to create you know, a space where people can be comfortable learning, asking questions and feeling like they, they are part of something bigger and better. And um, I have to say that the, the people that I have connected with, the people who I have invited to to speak, you know, during the Twitter Spaces session, the interactions on the timeline. I have to give credit back to the, the folks who engage because they have been, for the most part, very respectful of the rules of engagement that I set, um, but also coming out of their own place of goodwill, being willing to to you know go along with the agenda to say, hey, we we want to communicate respectfully here, we want to communicate accurately, and we we want to make sure that we are actually building a community as much as is possible on social media because there are limitations, right? Um, we are actually building a community, something sustainable, and we're exploring, we're letting our curiosity, you know, lead us where it leads us. And so I, I and also I think also the, the the community that I sort of affiliated myself with, if that's the word to use, the mythology and folklore community on Twitter, I have to you know shout them out here because they are just wonderful people. The focus is on the curiosity, the, the learning, the exploration, and um, that that really has been wonderful. A lot of how I run things is just borrowing from how different people in that community approach their work. And of course, I know what you mean about the folklore and mythology community at Twitter, but maybe you should explain to people about like how this whole hashtag thing works and how you intersect the African materials with all these other materials that 
Okay, so when, when I created Mythological Africans, I made a point to track down as many people who talk mythology and folklore, you know, in an obvious way on Twitter, and I followed them. And what I came to find out is that they have this wonderful thing that happens pretty much every day. Um, there is Mythology Monday, there is Fairy Tale Tuesday, there is Weird Wednesday, there used to be Folklore Thursday, um, but it's not an actively monitored hashtag now. There is Foshan Friday, there is Superstition Saturday, and there is Swamp Sunday, and there is Folklore Sunday as well now. And what, what this happens is there are people accounts who curate these hashtags, and every week there is a theme. So a theme could be water, for example, and then you just have this outpouring of stories from all over the world, um, folklore, myths, and all and the like that feature water. So it, it was first and foremost just a great place to learn, just to be there and see. If, if you if you're someone who loves stories like I do, it is the best thing ever because you just sit there and it's just stories, you know, China, India, Malaysia, Egypt, you know. Ireland, Native American, and it's 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 beautiful, it's wonderful. And then um, these these are the ones that I actively participate in. There are many, many, many others. I think there's Legendary Wednesday and um, Book Chat. Like there are just so many of these hashtags, but the focus is on talking about mythology and folklore from around the world. And when I first started participating in them, I noticed that you know yeah there are people who will tweet about mythology and folklore from the African continent sometimes, but there wasn't a consistent presence that was you know showing up for the myths and folklore from African uh, perspectives. So I, I took it upon myself to say, hey, this is this is a space I can fill as much as I can. And again, the reception was just warm and encouraging and supportive. And I, I really, really, really have benefited from being part of this community because the, the enthusiasm with which they would retweet and engage with the material. And sometimes just the sheer joy of finding out that, you know, this of folklore or a theme or some kind of motif from, I don't know, the Philippines, you know, shows up in a story from Nigeria or Tanzania. It's it's just been the most delightful. It's my favorite favorite part of Twitter right now. So, um, if if you're not if you're not conversant with these hashtags, I really really encourage you to follow them because it's it's beautiful. The stories, the pictures, just everything that comes with it, the conversations, you 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 will love it. I promise. So. And you mentioned Twitter spaces, too. I think there are a lot of Twitter users who aren't aware of that. I really learned about it thanks to you. So you might want to explain about what what that is, Twitter spaces. Right, right. Um, so something I noticed uh, just from being very online, for better or worse, um, is that you, you get bombarded with so much information, so much content. Which is a word I give me the heavy duty, but you get bombarded with so much information, so much you know, bits and pieces, news and all these things. And often there is not really a space to just take it all in, <laughs> you know, take it all in, talk about it with someone, you know, ask a question, get some confusion cleared up. Um, it's quite often the, the processing comes at the level of tweets back and forth. And not to say that that is, is not healthy all the time, but there is a lot that gets lost in communication, you know, when it's just people tweeting at each other or sort of tweeting each other as the case may be. So Twitter Spaces is um, a, 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 a what's it, tool functionality on Twitter, similar to Zoom, except there is no video component that I'm aware of. Um, but it, it's uh, an environment where you can have a group meeting, right? And people, just as we are now, you have someone hosting and people are able to talk. And how, how I use Twitter Spaces for Mythological Africans is that on Friday evenings, every Friday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, we have a storytelling session. Um, I read folklore from some people on the African continent. Uh, it's usually focused on people, a group of people. Um, and we talk about it, right? We, we read the stories, we talk about the people out of whom these stories come, and we we just, you know, go to town on the stories. Um, what, what are the questions I usually ask or the com commentary I invite from people um, has to do usually with, does this sound like something you've heard about in your own community? And that always comes up with very, very interesting um, responses. Um, and then just something that, that stood out to you, some theme, some aspect, 
And it, this has really created some lovely, lovely discussions. For example, when um, the unfortunate pushing back of Roe versus Wade happened, which basically jeopardized you know, access to abortion for many women here in the US, I, that day was a Friday and just there was so much despair on, on the Twitter timeline. I, I was thinking to myself, how, how do we even you know, approach this? What's the African perspective on this? And so that Twitter space that evening turned out to be just sitting down to explore the, the topic of, of abortion from different African peoples. And wow, it, it, to, to date, it's been one of my favorite sessions ever because we had perspectives which I hadn't, I wasn't aware of, like the fact that Kim Chaka um, was someone who didn't want children. So although he had all those many, many wives, he didn't want children. So he obviously had sexual relations with them. Where, where does babies go? You know, that's something that happened. We had stories where um, uh, uh, a Yoruba, an um, Ielao, didn't want to have children. And so she, she made sure she didn't have children when she was ready. And we, ex we explored different cultural approaches to you know, having children, having control over when you get children. We came to understand that um, in many African communities, women were not supposed to have children within two years of, of having a child, you know, to protect the health of the mother and to protect the health of the baby. So, but then people would still have sexual relations. So how was that taken care of? And then that, you know, opened up the topic of just how African peoples, some of them at least approached sex within the marriage context. So it just sprawled out into this amazing conversation with folklore and cultural knowledge and so much more in it. And that, that has tended to be the case. You know, we start from somewhere and then the conversation just balloons out into even more wonderful perspectives with people chiming in from different parts of the African continent and different parts of the world, which to me is, is the essence of what, you know, storytelling to begin with is about, because you start with how people back in the day did storytelling. We got together in the evenings after a hard day of work and full bellies, feeling good, maybe drinking some palm wine and playing musical instruments. And the, the skilled story, storytellers in the communities told these stories, which were, were ways by which people made sense of, of the world around them. So I imagine if something new and strange had happened, um, the storyteller that evening would find a way to weave it into their stories and, and you know, voila, you have folklore, you have oral literature. I think about the, the Bali Nyonga people in Cameroon, um, they're from, uh, from the northwest region of Cameroon, and they actually have a story that, that weaves in the arrival of German explorers, right? You know, how because it was so humid and their skin was red, you know, the, the story just incorporates that in somehow and that has become part of the Balinyonga corpus of stories. So I see Twitter spaces sort of as my attempt to, to bring this back, to use the stories that we have, but also connect them to actual happenings around us and to, to make sense of, of what's going on around us. Um, another example, it was a World Kiswahili Day a couple of weeks back. And so the storytelling was focused on oral literature from the, the Kiswahili people. And I learned so much during that session because you know, I wasn't aware that there has been a time in um, the history of Uganda and other Eastern African countries where the majority of key Swahili speakers were actually oppressive towards um, minority languages, and that introduces you know, some tension. But then there are some people who, because Kiswahili is so widely spoken, advocate for Kiswahili to become a, a Pan-African language. But then a Pan-African language that so many people have this traumatic history with, you know, that, that tension emerged and I was completely unaware of that. So um, just coming back to your question, the, the Twitter Spaces sessions really is my, my effort to bridge the gap between people getting bombarded with, with content which they may not have time to really process and uh, carving out space for people to really reflect, share their thoughts in a space where they're not going to get shut down, you know, learn new things and you know, keep the African storytelling tradition alive because that's that's what it's about people coming together and hearing things and learning something new from each other and being entertained when it really comes down to it. Well, and as someone who participates in these spaces, I have to say Helen is the best hostess ever. It is just, it is my goal to someday feel brave enough to host a Twitter space and to be able to do as good a job as, as Helen does because it's wonderful. Yeah. One of the things I want to ask about that that just amazes me about what you do is 
you're able to connect with different audiences, right? With, with African folks, African-Americans, people in the diaspora, Africans who are here, white folks like me who want to learn. How, how do you balance those different audiences, both in terms of how you interact with them, but also just how you direct your energies? You know, because you're finite. We, we don't have 100 Helens, even though we would need 100 or more of you. How do you make that work? So I, I think the, uh, the philosophy I approach mythological things with really helps with this. Um, it is primarily a space for African people on the continent and the diaspora to learn about who we are, our cultures, our stories, and all of that. But African people don't exist in a vacuum, right? We are part of the human family, and our history is the human story because, you know, you could take the, the idea that humanity evolved from out of the African continent and you know, migrated to the rest of the world. And the different facets of humanity that we have now reflect the, the encounters that people have had with the different environments that they have moved into, right? You know, meaning around, around the world. So with, with mythological Africans, um, that, that really is the underlying philosophy that, yes, this is a space primarily for African people on the continent and the diaspora, but African people in the context of the human story. And that is why I so value being part of the mythological and folklore community, because there's always that back and forth, right? Oh, this is your story. Oh, this is our version of the story. How did this happen? I, I try to stay away from the whole original version of the story thing, because is there really such a thing, original version? Um, it, it to me it doesn't make sense because different people, you know, humans across the world have similar experiences and will find ways to share them. Now it's possible that the way a story is told might have come from somewhere, but how far back are we going to go? I was talking with um, I probably might have been at Urban Nerd Con, um, just which just happened this weekend. When you think about the Silk Road, for example, right, which was straight, which extended from China all the way to the Middle East, or so you think, because the Silk Road continued as the trans, um, trans-Saharan uh, trade route all the way to West Africa. So for ages, you had people traveling from Africa all the way to China and back. And when they sat down in the evenings around their campfires, what did they do? They told stories. And these stories have marched back and forth, you know, at the same time trade was happening in Europe and all of that. Who knows where the stories come from? Who cares where the stories come from anymore? I mean, this is with the understanding that there is often, you know, an effort to devalue the African perspective. So we, we want to acknowledge that to say, hey, some stories have a distinct African flavor and we should not forget that. But ultimately, in my perspective, and there are people who will disagree with this, it is a human story. There are elements from all over the world brought into the African continent, as well as taken from the African continent to elsewhere. So my, my effort with mythological Africans is to, to cater to all of this as best as I can, quite often by letting the, the people who engage do the, the talking themselves. I speak from my perspective, my experiences, I share information that I, I gather from reading and other, other sources. But ultimately, I when when I finish reading a story and I say, hey, what do you guys think about this? This is insane, you know, that let us know what you think. What is your thought? What is your experience of the story? And so far that has worked because, you know, with the the grounding that okay, this is a space for African stories, but African stories with, within the context of the human story. I think people understand and appreciate and try to work with that. So quite often I'm not even thinking about it. You know, the fact that I, I have you know, an audience of people from the African continent, an audience of black people in the diaspora, and an audience of people from you know all around the world. It's just it, it comes up organically and I'm glad that so far it's working. You know, it might hit a snag somewhere, but I, I think the, the spirit of the community is to work with each other. So I, I think whatever snacks we hit, we'll, we'll be able to resolve. Well, and the world's about to be transfixed in about a month by an African story that's going to hit the movie theaters, right? With the Woman King coming out. And I know you have an event organized around that. I'll share a link in the, the chat, but why don't you tell us about that? Because I think th this is important, right? What you're going to be able to help us do when that movie comes out. Right. 
So um, The Woman King, in case you're not aware of it, which I doubt at this point, is a story by uh, Viola Davis, it's a film. And it is about the Ahosi, or the Nino, of the Kingdom of Dahomey, the so-called Amazons, because they were, uh, the, if my reading is right, the really only known all-female military regiment um, in, you know, historic, in the historical record. And they, they are controversial because as much of a, an important role as they played, not only in the King of the Kingdom of Dahomey, but in the, the African context, um, these were powerful, powerful women who, you know, served the king, had, you know, quarters in the palace, had their own servants, and were so integral to the running of the kingdom. Um, but then that involved unsavory aspects like, you know, raids on neighboring kingdoms and participation in the slave trade. So, excuse me, when the, when the trailer dropped, you know, there was a lot of buzz around it, um, you know, people who rightfully felt like, should we be giving a spotlight to these people? And my, my perspective on it has always been, your history is your history. You can't go around it. Your history is your history, and it's up to you to make of it what you will, right? There will be unsavory parts. There will be savory parts, you know, so to speak. And um, what it comes down to is what we learn from it and how we go forward. So, but then it goes back to that whole thing of people getting bombarded with content and not really getting a chance to process it because, you know, after this trailer dropped, there were threads and comments and all sorts of things about the story, some in defense of it, some, you know, not celebrating it. And I thought, well, we, all of this is just from a trailer, right? We don't even really know what this story is going to be about. This is all from a trailer. But then how about we have a conversation, right? And, and this came out of me observing my own reactions with a friend I was talking about, it, Rafiat, the, the um, friend I'm hosting the session with, because she, she shared, you know, the, the trailer and offered some commentary. And my initial reaction was, well, I mean, the, the AOC, they kind of sucked, you know, in some ways. So if their story is not received well, woohoo, you know. And then I thought about it and I said, Samurais, right, or Japan, for example, they are these celebrated characters, you know, but they were an instrument of conquest too, you know. They fought wars on behalf of the emperor or whoever they served, wars which hurt their own people sometimes, right? You think of the Spartans, or you think of any warrior, the ninjas, any warrior, you know, class of, of people in history. They have the same controversies. Now, the Ahosi are different because they participated in the slave trade, and this is just something so recent. And the state of the, the descendants of people who were sold is so, you know, in many ways, dismal in, in the Americas. So there is, there's, that's still a bit of a sore spot. But like I said, your history is your history, and it comes down to you to reconcile it somehow. But then there was also something else Rafiette said during one of our sessions, which made me go, huh. Because she said, when you really look at it, were these women as, you know, did they have as much agency as we thought? Because they served at the pleasure of the king. Some of them, you know, might not have been willfully conscripted. You know, they, they, they had limits and bounds around what they were able to do, how they were able to move within society. So immediately the complexity of it all jumped out to me. And it, it, it just couldn't be reduced to, oh, they were slave traders, you know, they can go away, we don't care about them. There is just so much in this story. I feel like if we if we limit our understanding of this movie to what is historically accurate or not, we're missing out on the point. Because we think about, you know, the world wars, mainly a European story. How many movies and books and, and goodness knows what have been written about the world war? From all perspectives, from the Nazi perspective, from the Allied perspective, from the Axis, we have all these stories which have helped people process the shared trauma of it, right? And all of these stories will have treaties, development plans, policies, and all of these things which have worked for the betterment of the people. But then you look at the African continent where there have been similar large scale wars, there have been similar conflicts, similar traumas. Where are the stories? that enable, whether fictional or factual, where are the stories that help us process all of this, you know, that perhaps will lead people to some kind of consensus on policy and all of that. 
So sitting with all of this, my thinking was, you know, why don't we talk about it in an organized way? We'll watch the movie, you know, because we can't say anything over the trailer, we just can't. We'll watch the movie, we'll do some reading, and then we'll, you know, create a space to have a conversation. So that's that's how this this came out of. And I I really have to give Rafiat credit here because talking with her, um, I, I noticed that I start out with a position and then as the conversation unfolds, because she has such a quiet but really powerful way of dropping, you know, knowledge. If you've been to any Twitter space session where she's there, she's amazing. You know, I find myself going like, hmm, what about this? Hmm, and what about that? And she is always ready with you know, a reading suggestion because she is incredibly well read. So I, I am excited about that conversation. We have a reading list, which is getting updated. I just have two more sources, which I will be adding to that. And thanks to the Internet Archive, a lot of these books are available for free, so you can check them out. Um, and then we're also running a bit of a raffle. So at the end of every week, for the people who like and retweet publicity tweets about the event, you enter, you get a chance to win a movie ticket or one of the books, a copy of one of the books that we're reading, which is not you know, publicly available. So again, just my effort to create space for people to reflect on things and not just, you know, that nonstop incessant bombardment with information. Um, yeah, so I, I think I've gone on and on and on about that. I'm going to stop here for now. Well, and like I said, I promise not to be greedy about asking all my questions. Do people have uh, questions that they want to ask? If you want to pop something in the chat or, or raise your hand. It looks like Nate has a question. Nate, ask your question. I see something in the chat. Yeah, sorry. I uh, when you started talking about um, when you started talking about the movie, I was there's a pretty big movie event coming up um, in the fall about this the new Black Panther movie. And at first, I thought maybe you were going to be talking about that, but then obviously you weren't, and it was really interesting. And so I was curious if you had thoughts about either the first Black Panther film or the one that's coming out this fall. I don't even know what, what to ask about it, but it's just like, what do you think about that in the context of all this other stuff that you're thinking about? All right. So let's start with, I am a huge Marvel fan. Like you guys don't even understand. I like, I love Marvel and I love the approach that they've taken to storytelling in the world different aspects and then everything comes together in this grand movie involving everybody and i love the black panther movies um there are things to critique about them it's fiction it's you know, fantasy it's science fiction it's futuristic i love that they they incorporate so many aspects of different Afri different african cultures and ideas and philosophies and i love that they depict African type people as powerful and influential in the, the, the sequence of events. Um, I love the first Black Panther movie. Absolutely love it. You know, the, the Dora Milaje are modeled after the Awasi of the Homi. So seeing that, you know, come to life and they occupy the same role, fierce, loyal defenders of the realm. I love it. I love it. And I felt so emotional after watching the, the recent Black Panther trailer because the, the storytelling I think is is just mwah. because first you know they don't gloss over the fact that Chadwick Boseman is gone I mean, may he rest in peace but he was such a central aspect of the Black Panther character I think he he perhaps even in his personal life um, based on what the people who know him talk about you know he, he really embodied that spirit of bravery of billions of service and so i love that they they are not trying to act like that didn't happen in real life you know um but you have this you know i, I don't know the story right i don't know the full story but i i just i love the fact that in the story you have you know, angela bassett who is a queen basically having a meltdown you know it's like i am the most powerful woman in, in you know i'm the queen of the most powerful kingdom in the realm and all my whole family is gone and when when you look at african histories right society could be very patriarchal but women you know in some kingdoms women were exceptionally powerful in the in the Dahomey kingdom for example women had a lot of power the queen mother you know sometimes had more sway than even the king sometimes in certain spheres so, so just to have that, you know, 
that that glimpse of Angela Bassett having that moment, you know, it, it was just so powerful for me. And of course, the emotionality of these people reckoning with the loss of you know, such a central character, a central force, a central figure. Um, it's, it speaks to me to the, the, the dynamic that is the, the African heritage, right? Of being powerful, but you know, feeling vulnerable in so many ways of, of having suffered a great loss, but still finding a way to rally and move forward. And I can't wait. I can't wait. We might have a Twitter space about that now that I think about it, because it, it, it is one of those stories that um, has a way of bringing people together on the internet, for better or worse. So we, we just might have a space about that too. That would be great, I think. And Helen, did you pick out a story that you wanted to read today? I did, I did. And the book is... Yeah. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. And I'm staying away from internet things today because in the past we've had this weird challenge where in the middle of the session, you know, internet craps out and we, we can't we can't read. So this this is one of the this is one of the first uh, books I started consulting. Um, this was a gift actually from a mythological African patron and it's a collection of stories from across the African continent and it's one of my reference texts amongst others. Um, but I'm going to read a story from this one. Do you, do you want to do that right now? Or We probably should because time is just racing away from us and I didn't want to miss out on the chance to hear a story you picked out. So, of course. All right, so the story I want to read it's the old woman with source. And um, I, I love this story because stories of old women with source show up quite a bit in African uh, folklore. And usually your reaction to these women determines what your fate is going to be, right? So the old woman with source, and let me just check something real quick here. Make sure that so the old woman with swords is a story from the Ituri people. The Ituri people are found in uh, Congo, the Congo region, Central Africa. And before I start, I am going to read the book, the story as it is here. But I want to note that the, the term Kukini is used in the book. But um, from my understanding, that term is, is considered you know, derogatory now, the preferred way to address the people, the forest people. And uh, these are some of them, well, if not the most, uh, the indigenous people of African people. So in, in many stories you read, it is a story of different um, African peoples moving into an area and encountering these forest people. So um, the old woman with stores, with source, a story from the Ikiri people in the Congo. So one day, a young woman decided to go and look for a wife. He heard that there was a beautiful girl of marriageable age only two villages away, so he set off in that direction. As he passed the first village, an old woman called out to him. Come here, young man, she cried. The young pygmy turned around to see who was calling him, and he saw an old, old woman sitting on the ground, hugging her knees. Horrible to look at, she was ready onto sickness and all covered in sores. You're very ill, mother, he answered her, and I don't want to get sick. I am passing through on my way to get married, so I, I can't come near you. Very well then, she said, go ahead. And so the young man went to the next village. When he reached the next village, he saw a kind looking elder sitting outside his house singing. The young pygmy greeted him and sat down. The elder went on singing for a while and then said, there's a young girl here looking for a man just like you. The pygmy was delighted at his good fortune and said, fine, fine, I'll sleep here then. Then the two of them made songs together, for this is what pygmies are known for. When evening came, the young pygmy went in and slept with the girl. When he was fast asleep, the elder crept into the room and killed him. The next morning, one of the young pygmy brothers said, our brother went down the road and hasn't come back. I'll go and follow him. And so he left following the same path. 
As he passed the first village, the diseased old woman was still sitting on the ground, hugging her knees. Come here, young man, she called. The pygmy looked around to see who was summoning him, and then he hurried on all the more quickly, saying, You're all covered with sores, old woman, and I don't want to get sick. I won't come near you. Very well, then, the woman said. Go ahead. The pygmy went on until he reached the next village, where he saw the kind-looking elder sitting outside his house singing. Have you seen my brother, asked the young pygmy, after they had exchanged greetings. Oh, yes, answered the man. He came yesterday and passed the night here. He is out walking in the village just now. Why don't you sit down a while? So the young pygmy sat down, and the elder told him that there was a fine young girl in the house looking for a husband just like him. The pygmy was delighted. Fine, he said. I'll sleep here then. And then the two of them started singing away together. Night fell, and the pygmy went into the girl's room and slept with her as his brother had done. While he was sleeping, the elder crept in and killed him too. The third pygmy, their brother, was very worried when neither of his brothers returned, and the next morning he set off to find them. As he passed the first village, the old woman with swords was sitting on the ground and probing her knees. She looked up and called out, Come here, young man. The young pygmy turned to see who was speaking to him and went to the old woman. Well, mother, he asked, what can I do for you? There is a wicked old man in the next village, said the woman. He sits outside his house and sings. He traps young men like you by telling them of his beautiful daughter. He has killed your two brothers, and when you go in to sleep with his daughter, he will try to kill you. The young pygmy was very upset and could not think what to do. Here is a bird, said the old woman. Take it with you and it will protect you. The young man was very upset and could not think what to do. So he took the bird, thanked the old woman for her kindness, and went on his way. He traveled on to the next village, and there was the elder sitting outside his house singing. He greeted the pygmy and invited him to sit down. Have you seen my two brothers? asked the boy. Oh yes, replied the elder. They are visiting friends in the village. Why don't you rest here a while before going to look for them? So the pygmy sat down. Then, after a little time had passed, the old man said, there's a pretty young girl who are looking for a young man just like you. Fine, said the pygmy. I'll sleep here then. The elder sang, and the pygmy sang. Night came, and the pygmy went into the young girl's room. He lay down to sleep with her. Outside, the old man sat in the darkness and sang. The pygmy sang. And then the pygmy fell asleep. And the bird that he had been given by the old woman continued to sing. The bird went on singing, and the old man listened and said, I cannot go in and tell him as yet. He's still awake. I shall wait. But the bird sang even louder, and before long, the old man himself was asleep. Then the singing bird woke up the pygmy, and he came out and killed the old man. Then the pygmy took the girl back to his village, and on the way, he passed the old woman with swords. He greeted her and told her what had happened. Good, she said. Then he went onto his village where he told all his friends and relations how he had killed the bad old man who had killed his two brothers and how he himself had been saved by the talking bird given to him by the old woman with swords. And he lived happily then with his young one. And so, awesome. so this is how I know it's Friday. I get to hear Helen read me a story. So this is a good Friday. We're going to have spaces later, but that was awesome. Do other people want to chime in with thoughts about this story? I'm guessing it's new, a new story to most of you. Yeah, well, as we would say during the Twitter Spaces session, what do you all think about this story, friends? Just feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. You know, for, for me as a, a student of fairy tales and folk tales. I love that this is a formulaic story. I recognize the formulaic elements, but I've never heard a story quite like this one from uh, anywhere else. I'm just gonna take a quick look in the chats here. Okay. And read Heather's comment here out loud. Um, are there any topics or characters that exist within our world 
now that you wish were more present in mythologies or fairy tales that have been shared in your Twitter spaces? You know, honestly, I can't think of, of a single one because when you think about it, you know, the, the, the main character types, you know, or topics come down to the human experience, you know, the, the main archetypes, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, the, the wise old woman, the evil old man, the innocent young boys, the, the foolish ones who don't listen to advice, the young maiden in a difficult position that gets rescued, or if you flip it around, you know, there are cases where it's the young maiden doing the rescuing in some stories. Um, so far, no. So far, no. I think uh, many of the, the modern themes, the modern stories, the characters and motifs are well represented in the stories. Um, but that's something I'm going to pay attention to now that you mentioned it. You know, if, if there are any, especially since, you know, the world is changing so fast with technology and, you know, so many different ideas, meeting and interacting with each other. I am definitely going to keep an eye out for that now because that, that would be interesting to explore. And um, if, I, if I may, a few things that stand out to me in the story, you know, the, the fact that the, the pygmy singing is something that you know is noted and then that's that's a thing right i think um i forget which uh, ancient historian excuse me recorded it but their their singing was noted all the way back to the time of the egyptian pharaohs they're singing the, the dancing and singing of the, the forest people and there are many videos um, online today they do the polyphonic singing so it's almost like you telling but it has a there's a there's a way in which it's just so very beautiful. And they also do the thing, um, some, some of the forest people do the water drumming. It's called the Quindy, where they stand in the pond or in the river and they have a way they move their hand in the water, which creates this really nice drumming-like sound. And so, and a lot of the stringed instruments and, you know, a lot of that comes out of the culture of forest people. There are, there are stories from the folklore of different non-forest peoples which involve them learning how to make and play these instruments from forest people so that the musicality of the culture is very well known very well documented but also the the old woman resource like i talked about um some person in an unfortunate circumstance who needs help and whether or not you help them that that good samaritan theme for lack of a better way of putting it shows up quite a bit but um the the old woman resource is a particular kind of a character that shows up quite a bit in, in, in folklore from Central and Southern Africa. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there for now because there are many ways we can pull this story apart and, and dig into it. So. Oh, and Heather's asking a follow-up that is very much a topic that I know you're interested in about non-binary and transgender identities in African traditions. So that's uh, that's an interesting question, and I want to preface my response with the fact that I am still learning so much here. So don't take what I say with the understanding that I am still learning. I, that there were non-binary or transgender people in African cultures is indisputable. They're doc they're documented across cultures in various ways. Um, are there stories about them? Such characters will pop up, but my, my thinking is that because the, um, the, the, the attitude that many African people took towards issues of sexuality was one of, you don't get to know about these things until you're of age. Um, and I imagine in many cases, these were not things that were comfortably talked about with the, the, the ethnographers and anthropologists who documented the stories. Now, if you read, you know, collections of erotic African folklore, such as Frobenius's and the like, you will see stories of, you know, a man who was effeminate and dressed as a woman and had this wild, I'm talking so wild, I refused to read the story during one of our Twitter space sessions. He had this wild escapade, which I was like, wow, hey, look, we're doing that then. You know, 
um, I did not read the story because I, I felt like it fed into negative stereotypes and there is just so much that goes on there that that was in the space. Um, I'm hoping to find a way to approach these stories because they, they say something about the attitude that African peoples have towards, towards sexuality. Um, but they transgender and non-binary people existed and still do. Um, to make sure that that's, that's well emphasized. But their story is complex because in some societies they were accepted, they were a known quantity, they were celebrated. And in some, con in some communities they were not, right? In some communities, the circumstances under which they assume those identities you know, have the question marks around them. And it's, it's one of those issues which I feel because of the point of time we are in the history of you know queer people in the world, there is a, a, it's easy to you know throw factoids at people and say this and say that, but it I think it it demands more respect and care because you could as I did find out stories which you know put you in a place where you don't even know what to say. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, Heather. I, I know that I tread very carefully here because it, it is, you know, and, and it's a controversial issue because on the one hand, you could find yourself sharing information that gives bigots, violent bigots, you know, ammunition. And I, I don't want to do that because whatever our forebears thought about people, we have a responsibility to ourselves now to respect the humanity in people. So yeah, I think that's as far as I'm gonna go there. Hopefully that that you know gave you something to work with. I find it not satisfactory, but I'm learning. So yeah. Well and I know we don't have very much time. Oh is that a question? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> right, Hector, right. Hainas in, in, in African folklore uh, are interesting. There's a lot that is associated with them. And honestly, because if I understand correctly, uh, hyenas have that androgynous, like, hemophroditic uh, something about their biology, I wouldn't be surprised to find out somewhere that that association has been made. But... Um, because of other characteristics, hyenas have different connotations in, in African folklore. What I found interesting was that for some people, a way to protect children was they would take little pouches of hyena poop and put them on their bodies as amulets. And you know, at first thought it's like, why in the heck would you do that? But then I was thinking about it. Hyenas are very territorial, so they, they use their poop to mark their territory. So what a wonderful way to protect children, <laughs> right? Because if they go around smelling like some hyena's territory, it tells hyenas to stay away. I, I think that is just brilliant. I think that is brilliant. So much to find out, like you said, fun stories to track down and so little time. There's, there's just so much, so much. And you've, you've walked into the hyena nexus here because Hector is here who works on hyenas. And there are stories, folk tales about hyenas stealing babies. They're kind of like urban legend type folk tales, but you can find them in story collections about hyenas who steal babies. And sometimes they talk to you while they do it because they're talking hyenas, but it is it is a thing. Now, I know there's one question I have to ask Helen here before we run out of time, because you also write stories. And I would say so different from these traditional types of stories, which are told in the third person read some of your stories that are written in first person. So what is it like for you as you craft new kinds of stories and a new kind of style as, as a modern writer, but working with traditional motifs. What is that like for you? So this is somewhere I, I struggle a lot, um, mainly because I don't speak our traditional language very well. And that is part of that interruption of traditional ways of knowledge that happens. You know. um, I just, I didn't learn. So, and, and there is, there is something you lose when you're not able to hear stories in their original language. There are so many nuances, wordplay, things that just go out the window. So that, that part is challenging, you know, stories from within my own culture, but of course working with other cultures, because I don't speak any of their languages. Um, but 
the way I see it, at the end of the day, a story is a story, right? And the human experience is the human experience. And my my approach is to be as true to the culture out of which I'm writing as possible, but to just allow myself to have fun, right? So to be as stay as close to the culture as possible, but allow myself to have fun to step into the shoes of the different characters and say, hey, based on what I know about the human experience and these people, what would they do here? Or what's the something that they could do that would be out of character, that would lead the story into a new, new dimension? Um, I still, you know, I, I, I hesitate a little bit because there is that sense of hey, you don't want to misrepresent people's culture. But there is such a thing also as creative license. So it, it's a balancing act. You know, saying okay, I, I can go here, but you know, maybe not too far in that direction. Pull it down a little bit, um, but it's fun. Ultimately, I think it's fun. I really enjoy it. Um, one of my projects right now is focused on that. So, um, yeah, I, it's challenging but fun. And thank you, Heather. It was really nice to have you here. I see she's sticking. So. Well, and, and somehow we have used up an hour, but listen, everybody, here's what's great. You can get more of Helen this afternoon in the Twitter spaces, right? right. And right. Um, I get my time zones all mixed up. I had the wrong time zone in the announcement on the web page, but I fixed it because it's at six o'clock in Atlanta, right? So six o'clock Eastern, that's five o'clock my time. Other people with advanced math skills can figure out the other times. Um, I just... I can't say enough about what Helen has done for me and my work and inspiring me to, to, to reach out and think about communities. And I was just so glad that you could be able to be part of my fest and come visit with us, Helen. I really appreciate it. And, and the feeling is mutual, Laura, because as you know, um, I started out with a logical actress feeling really, you know, limited by what I had to work with. You know, I, will dig into archives on Google Scholar and whatnot. Um, but just running into your work, which funny story if you guys have time for it. So the first time I have a I had a conversation with Laura, we're sitting there talking about sources and things, and I start talking about this amazing myth and folklore blog, which just was a lifesaver when I started doing mythological Africans. And I share a link with Laura, come to find out this is one of her old blogs from way back in the day. So I didn't even know who I was talking with at that time. And that, that really is you know, the history and the dynamic of how I work with Laura, because she, if you're here, you're probably familiar with her work, feels prolific at you know, pulling together sources, digging through the archive, especially in the archive, and making things available and accessible, which in the sphere of Afghan folklore and folklore is just, it's amazing. I, I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate your work. And it really, of course, of course, I will come to my fest to hang out with you because it's, it's fun, you're fun, amazing. So thank you. And that's the power of blogging, right? If you blog, then lo and behold, like 15 years later, you get to make a wonderful friend at Twitter who found you through your blog, right? And if you blog on obscure things, people will find you because heck, Google will find you. Yeah. And I should say, Helen's an independent scholar, right? So, and, and now I am too, since I'm without an institution and we've both gotten a lot out of the Internet Archive. So for those of you who haven't followed the work we've been doing with Internet Archive, check it out. It, it's millions of books at your disposal, like a library that you can check out for an hour at a time. I guess I say goodbye, but hopefully it won't be goodbye. We can all keep connecting online and at Twitter. Absolutely. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, you all. Um, if you have time, join us this evening at 6. We're reading stories and talking about them. But otherwise, hope to see you on the Twitter streets. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank okay. you. See you later.